Good morning and welcome to Rising. That's a show hosted by us, and this is it, and it's starting now. <laughs> Channeling a little Perk Happily this morning from uh, Parks so and Rec. So I see. <laughs> How did we get so lucky? <laughs> All right, what's going on? Well, the big news is that a deal has been reached in favor of railroad workers. Washington Post reporters Lauren Gurley and Jeff Stein report that railroads have agreed to give workers the ability to take days off from medical care without being subject to discipline. Stein says that this was the key demand that railroad workers wanted to strike over, and they got it. According to the report, President Biden was personally animated about the lack of leave for railroad workers and pushed for the deal. The final agreement includes voluntary assigned days off and a single additional paid day off and provides workers with the ability to take unpaid days for medical care without being subject to attendance policies. Mm. Well, meanwhile, the Department of Labor called it the agreement that balances the needs of workers, businesses, and our nation's economy. This comes, of course, after Amtrak canceled all long-distance trains yesterday in anticipation of the strike that would see thousands of engineers, conductors, and other railroad workers leave their posts. According to Jeff Stein, there's a lot more that could go wrong if a shutdown occurred. In addition to Amtrak closing, ammonia, fertilizer, and the entire agricultural system would be disrupted. The price of ethanol, other products would soar, and grain shipments could stop, which obviously would be catastrophic. I was reading that uh, now apparently just kind of normal passenger train service in our corridor in the Northeast was not going to be affected. Mm. But, uh, but you know, the, the much more imp impactful for the economy would be these products um, not being available at a time where obviously the supply chains are already stressed. We're, you know, on the possibly on the brink of a recession or have just come out of one. Um, it's uh, so I think it's extremely good news that a strike has been averted, at least for now, hopefully for good. And and look, as I said on the show yesterday, I I don't have any issue uh, with private sector unionization for workers coming together and uh, and organizing for better treatment and conditions. These conditions sound very difficult, mm -hmm. and I I'm. I'm glad they got uh, they got some concessions here from management. I would be fine with more concessions, but uh, we really don't want to strike because that would be so bad for the economy. Well, look, I think this is an interesting moment for Americans who, for the last, I don't know, 60, 70 years ago, are relatively unfamiliar with these kind of strike threats and how they were able to finally actually secure some rights for workers uh, that are not usually given over without really, really, really tough battles like this one. Uh, and I'll talk more about this in my radar, but it's important to note that the kind of preemptive shutdowns that started to, to happen were the result, uh, reporter, labor reporters like jo Jonah Furman were making this clear yesterday, they were the result of Amtrak, or not Amtrak rather, the railroad companies trying to squeeze workers, preemptively shutting down and basically threatening the government to say, you have to come on our side and help us force the workers to the table and force them to go ahead and work. Remember, they've been working without a contract for three months now all over this one relatively narrow demand to simply be able to take time off. And it literally took shutting down the country for these railroad workers, 120,000 odd railroad workers, to get this. After years of being told that they were essential workers, that they were so crucial to the supply chain that America couldn't roll without them. And All those things are true. It, they are they, crucial they to the supply much chain. They are true. And what, and what will, I think will be interesting to see is whether or not this is a moment that helps Americans understand the importance of labor and how our fates are all linked, or whether this is a moment where people will, as I saw a lot of the media doing, kind of sneer at the idea that people would shut down the economy and cause inflation to be worse. Um, and focus, a real focus on what's going to happen to the consumer as opposed to what this means about the workers' rights and interests. Well, I don't think it's wrong to bring up what would happen to consumers. We're all consumers. We're not all railway workers. Well, we're all wor many more of us are workers than uh, our consumer value. Uh, we can't consume unless we have money to spend on it, right? right? And the reality is that there are v significant cultural differences between the United States and other countries where, frankly, they have a lot more labor rights and protections because they do go on strike more frequently. I observed this when I was in France over the summer during their transit strike, and even though there was a lot of congestion, it was very inconvenient, there was, you know, one rental car left in the whole city and it had a stick shift and it was very expensive that we had to rent. I mean, there were a lot of things to be legitimately in, in, irritated by. But when I, we spoke to folks, they were like, ah, they strike, this is what happens, c'est la vie. And they understood that workers being able to fight for higher wages had an effect on the broader economy that it benefited them as well. 
And they did it. There was none of this kind of antagonism or really quick leaping to, oh, but is this going to ruin my commute that I tend to see here in America. Mm. But we're a much wealthier country than all those countries, and possibly in part because we ask more of our laborers. I think there is a lot more concentrated wealth at the very top and a lot of unequal distribution of wealth in the United States because we don't pay workers for the value of their labor. And as I'll talk about on my radar, the, the railroad barons who run the four major railroad companies have seen unprecedented profits at the same time well, they rail, were denying uh, a day off. Sure, and, and rail is a very cronyist enterprise, very uh, the uh, level of collusion, maybe, maybe by necessity, although I tend to think you could have um, much more private ownership and much more um, decentralization and much more actual competition, but as it exists, it yeah, is, is such a... Monopolies are definitely an issue in the railroad yeah, issue. It's a, it's a huge monopoly issue. So how do Americans feel about the labor movement? Uh, according to new polling, voters in key battleground states say they are much more likely to support a pro-union candidate over an anti-union candidate. Heart Research released these numbers that show pro-labor candidates have a 24-point advantage with swing voters mm. and especially appeal to young voters. Mm. And I think this was part of what helped uh, Biden in the final stretch over Donald Trump. You know, he you know, stood behind a whole host of anti-union policies after really kind of framing himself during the 2016 primary as someone who was in a a bit of a different mold from other Republicans in that respect. Someone who championed worker rights, who was very critical of some of these neoliberal deals like NAFTA that were so destructive to so much of the labor force. Uh, and it looks like people are recognizing that perhaps their actions matter more than just mm -hmm. those kinds of words. There's no doubt that um, Donald Trump's fr or perceived friendliness with labor was a huge advantage to him, not just over Hillary Clinton, but within the Republican mm -hmm. field, because you have this uh, this kind of voter who's now much better understood, but at the time was not well understood that they were sort of con they had kind of conservative social values in some sense, or at least not hardcore you know, progressive social values, but they were workers and they had had a good relationship with labor. Maybe they were dissatisfied with labor management and, you know, perceived closeness to the Democratic Party on those cultural social issues, but on the bedrock economic issues, grateful for what labor has done. And Donald Trump understood that. Um, and, and it was a, a major part of his success. I'm not surprised, I guess, that, you know, young people, just to the extent that they're much more to the left on basically every axis uh, would be more uh, maybe maybe the labor movement maybe I don't know maybe it's cyclical um, because there was a, obviously a high point for labor and then you know support for labor and labor's actual power has eroded somewhat I mean there were some associations of labor with crime and with intimidation and corruption and all sorts of things but uh, maybe people maybe that's far enough well, a, in lot, the a lot of these young people are also just really working class laborers these days as we lose social mobility in my generation, the generation behind us. Uh, there's a lot of sneering about baristas that comes from the political elite echelons, but that's the average working class worker these days. It's a retail worker, not someone in a hard hat in a mine. Right. And I think that the kids are, are realizing that. They live right. it. Well, we're eager to continue this subject, uh, which is in your radar, which is coming up 